All of us are in Sultan. That is the first one. We call one. This is the one. I'm going to say, 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 Oh, yeah. We can do that for the like, number of sentences you are taking in there for that review, like if you have doing something on starting or so if you have a constant on it. That's possible. So, how does that go? Good? Maybe what? All problems? Okay, so who's done most of the coding or all of it? Anybody? All of it? Is it all working? Not, not yet? ECOC? Is it working? Right now? Yeah. During the lecture? <laughs> oh, okay. ECOC? Max? No? Try or did you try it? Be honest. No, I have to try it. I'm close to getting to work. All right, so I'm going to move on. Okay? Uh, I mentioned last time something that I wanted to start last time and I didn't. Uh, and uh, you guys still working on homework five. And we have homework six now. Uh, so what we're gonna do now, we're gonna change a little bit of focus for, for a little while. We're gonna say, okay, wh wh what happened here? We talk about this data, right? So let's recap all day to the first uh, day of the course. What is the data? It's a matrix that looks like this, right? And this is the data points one, two, up to n. Uh, so that's x, k right here. That's a data point. And those are the columns, one, two, d, right, the features. So that would be x, k, one, x, k, two, up to x, k, d. And then from this data, we also have this vector y of labels. Right? y1 up to y n. Those are the labels. We apply algorithms to learn those patterns. So we can, once we learn our model or patterns, we can just apply the same thing on a test point or production point and predict the label. That was the one shot of supervised learning. So within this realm, we, we went to decision trees and you know, regressions and neural networks and uh, boosting algorithms and so on and so forth just to get on the algorithmic part of, okay, how do you get to learn from x to predict y, right? Along the way, we talked about some other interesting things, like how do you fit Gaussian functions in it? That, that's a problem in itself. It's not necessarily supervised learning. Learning how to fit a mathematical model like a Gaussian can be applied in many other, other uh, setups. Now, uh, for this week, and possibly a little bit of next week, I want to talk about these features and how to think about them. So see, so far, I think in most of the problems, I gave you this matrix, right? This is spam base or house data, just there, right? In reality, very rarely this matrix is offered like that, plain, here, there you go. In reality, data comes from, say, images or patient records or, or songs or movies. And it's not that obvious how to take movies or patients, or news articles, or spam, even spam emails, and make it into those, those. This is a numerical feature matrix, right? Everything in here is just numbers. So how do people take emails and produce that that matrix? Because emails, as we all know, they're just pieces of text, right? I'm sure you've seen this problem before, and you are aware of it. I can take the words and figure out how, how, many, how many times a word appears, and the word becomes a feature. That's the word Virgil right here. And this would be the how many times Virgil appeared in every single email, for example, right? Or I could take an image and measure its contrast. And the contrast is a numerical value. And, and then the, and a numerical value, I have a feature here, contrast. That would be, you know, numerical values for contrast in every single image. So those are good intuitive examples. If, I'm sure everyone has seen this. And it's aware of the fact that there's got to be a process from raw data, aka images, into features, matrices, so I can run regression on this data set. But if I just dream up features like that, contrast, is that enough to do my task? Maybe I need another one. Maybe other people dream about the features they have. So how do I think about it? Can I can I be exhaust can I can I extract all possible features? Just 
feed them into the algorithm. That's more like a philosophical question. All possible features, what does it mean? Like, how do I know I didn't miss anything? Right? So that's one problem. The other problem related to features is, so one problem is feature extraction. Well, we won't deal with this right away, but it's on our plan. Another problem is to uh, feature <coughs> processing reduction. That's the one we're going to talk about today. It's independent of algorithm and dependent. Let's say uh, ML algorithm. What I have in mind here is if somebody gives me a feature matrix, like I gave you in all those homeworks, if I didn't apply the machine learning algorithm yet, this question here is can I look into these features and do some processing? Maybe reduce the space, there are too many, make fewer out of it, detect correlated features or in advance somehow figure out that I don't need feature two. No matter what the algorithm is, no matter what the task is, I can just get rid of feature two. So here is the part that we're gonna talk about today. Independent of the machine learning algorithm, uh, what's a good example for a processing of feature set before I even know what to do with it? Uh, is it like you run a decision tree and see which feature does depend on? Like, is that like right. dependent on ML algorithm? That, that's dependent of the ML algorithm because you run a decision tree and your whole thing is based on what the decision tree did. In other words, if you say to select, I'm gonna select top 10 features. Obviously, a different algorithm might pick different features. Might not. I mean, there might be an argument that no matter what algorithm you use, this is the top features that you, you need. That's a different piece of the story. Is, in the, is, is it the same top features that matter or not? But if you only run algorithm, how are you gonna know that those features that you have the top 10, aka the first 10 splits in the tree, are the one that matters? So I, I would put this for now in the second category because it comes from a learning algorithm, right? What would be clearly in this category? Normalization, standardization, what else? What about like the rank of the matrix? Rank of, the, of this matrix. That's definitely independent of the algorithm. Right? He's only looking at the matrix. He says, what's the rank of this matrix? He doesn't call for an algorithm. But wh why would the rank of the matrix matter? I mean, I'm talking more to the linear algebra. What, what the rank of a matrix does to me? Tells you the number of independent uh, so that would be sort of like if you were to measure how many features you have independent of other features, right? It will tell you that. And if that number is significantly smaller than D, so D could be 50,000 features. If the rank is, you know, 200, that's a lot smaller in a linear sense. If you think of regression, if a feature is dependent linearly on the other features, you don't need to include it in the regression sum, right? Are we all aware of that in terms of linear algebra? The regressor is sum of wi xi, right? If feature number three is a linear combination of the other features, that is for all data points, it's a linear combination, then I can just modify the w in such a way that without including the third feature, I get the same result. Because you can think of this as, say, say x1. This is a sum, this is from i equal one to d. Say I put i equal two to d of w2 xi, right? So I skip the first feature, plus w1, that's the first feature, but now the first feature is a linear combination of the other features, right? So that would be the sum from i equal two to d of the linear combination li times xi, right? That, that is in here, in fact, x1. A linear combination of the other two. So now you can see how by just doing the multiplications, I can get a regressor without x1. So I think his point was, 
in the sense of regression or linear combinations, if some of them are dependent of the others, maybe we don't need those. A uh, W2, is that supposed to be a WI? Yeah. So you said that if What if I have half of the features linear dependent of some? What if I have all the features just linearly dependent of, like, say, 100 features? I can just use those, right? That's the point. So, so you said that if D is significantly smaller than the... If the rank. Rank. So what, what, what does it mean? It is what does it mean to us? Uh, if the rank is 100, uh -huh. it means all the columns <coughs> are a linear combination of 100 of them. You can pick 100 columns. Uh -huh. And every single column is a linear combination of those 100. There are only 100 linear independent columns or rows. So that's the rank of a matrix. Hands up who remembers that from high school. Rank of a matrix. How many linear independent rows or columns we have. Right? That is everybody else is dependent on those. That is also the smallest, the, the biggest matrix you can have with a non-zero determinant. Sub matrix. As soon as you go over 100 rows and 100 columns, the determinant has to be zero because it's linear dependency causes a zero determinant. So if it is significantly smaller than D, then it means that most of us, uh, most of our features are correct. Right. So do you only have 100 independent features and there is a benefit? Now, that is in a linear sense. Independence in a probabilistic sense means something else. So let make a clear distinction for mathematicians out here. One is to say linear dependence. Everybody knows what that means. It's a linear combination of the others. But it's a different thing in a probabilistic sense. Probabilistic independence means something else. Now, I'm not saying in either case that those features should be thrown out. His point was if you are to use regression, you don't need those linear dependent features because you can get exactly the same regression function only using the independent features. But maybe a decision tree could very well use the linear dependent features because decision trees are not linear mechanisms or GDAs or no, who knows? Neural networks are linear, but then they have a non-linear function in there, right? Who knows what's happening? So it doesn't mean that if they're linear, they're not useful for an algorithm. It definitely means they have no new information. If they can be obtained from the other features, as far as information goes, I don't need them in the matrix because I, I only need to know how they depend on these other features. Would this be true for like any linear classifier? or just regression? This will be true for any linear classifier. Uh, because anything you can do with those features, you can obtain from the independent features. Now, so that's good. We, we are on a start. What will be something that you all heard of that's in this category, in this linear sense? What will be the processing reduction I'm talking about here? that I'm saying, hey, I can do this before I apply my machine learning algorithms to kind of get rid of this linear dependency. What would that be? Anybody knows that? PCA. Sure, we all have the PCA. P stands for? Component, Component analysis. analysis. Right. This is independent of the algorithm. I can run it ahead of the data. And it deals exactly with this problem, linear dependency. You want to get rid of the dependent linear features? You can run PCA, very easy algorithm, very fast to run. And not just the problem mathematically with linear dependence is that it's a very exact, well-defined thing. What does it mean to be linear? It means this. In practice, data will never be exactly linear dependent. You pick a feature, it's an approximation of a linear combination of the other features, but it's not exactly that. So I need something more approximative. I can't just be in, in a strict sense linear dependent. I, I gotta, I gotta um, work a little bit on, on what's a, approximative linear dependent. So PCA will do that for me. And the other thing that I wanna put here is feature analysis. <coughs> part that I'm going to concentrate more. There, there's a lot of stuff in there. I'm going to work on these margins. Because I not only want to address the concept of margins for now, it's going to be something extremely useful when we move on to the next model. So we need to get our minds wrapped 
about what those markings are. Um, and I also have one more thing, maybe put it here, that's number four. Uh, that's number three, let's put it here. Feature, uh, selection. Uh, selection as opposed to reduction. Reduction, PCA, at the, result, uh, at the end of PCA, as you probably know, we don't have a subset of the original features. We do have features, we have fewer than before, but the ones we have are not exactly, you know, a subset of those. PCA kind of uh, combines the features together, it takes, you know, 50,000 features, make out of them 200 features, but those 200 are combinations of the original 50,000. By selection, I mean exactly figuring out a subset, say, you know, out of those 50,000, can you just select 10 that are the most useful, or 50, or 100? So the idea that was being said before, there's run a decision tree for a while, maybe a deep decision tree, and then pick the top 25 features, or 30 features. That would be here in the feature selection uh, bullet, but it's algorithm dependent, right? And in fact, decision trees are naturally doing exactly that. Nobody runs a decision tree all the way down to, to, to 50,000 features, right? So every time you choose to stop a decision tree algorithm, effectively we've got a feature selection, right? Because suppose I do, I don't know, maximum 60 splits in my field, or maximum 60 leaves. By the nature of decision trees, I've just used 60 features at most. That's assuming I'm not repeating a feature along the way, right? So decision trees are very natural feature, feature selection algorithm. Anytime you stop them, Boosting with decision trees the same way. I have a tree here, plus another tree, plus another tree, plus another tree, right? If every tree has like three or four splits, and I run this algorithm other boost for 100 rounds, at most, when I'm done, I've used 300 features or 400 features, right? At most, that's assuming they don't repeat. So, again, if I have a space of 50,000 features, other boost, it's a decision selection, feature selection algorithm because it picks the most useful 300 out of 50,000. All right. So uh, indeed, for feature selection algorithm dependent, trees are the core, the, the basic idea that we can use. But if I don't use an algorithm like a decision tree, how would I select features? Can, can I do this kind of thing in advance? Like. Uh, can I select a subset of features, not PCA, because again, PCA is not producing a subset, it's producing a combination of the features. But if I want to select a subset without knowing I'm going to use a decision tree or regressor or whatever, can I do that? Can I look at my feature matrix and say, little by little, let's, let's select some features that I want in or some features that I want out? Yes? Domain knowledge. Hmm? Based on the domain knowledge, if you have the domain knowledge, you can. Right, so that, that's not an algorithmic process. Yeah. So it's saying you can ask a doctor, if those are patients, you can ask a doctor what matters here, right? Okay, and the doctor will tell you this, this matters. Uh, how about if I say, uh, suppose I already selected X1, X2, and X3 as features. So those are in. Can I look at the others and somehow estimate which one of the other features are more correlated with those? which is probably not so useful, and less correlated with the ones I already have, and probably that means more useful, right? The idea of adding a feature to, to the useful set of features would always be to add new information, right? There's no point in adding something that repeats the information I already have. Most algorithms will be able to make sense of features properly. So in feature selection, we often have the problem of if I already have those five features, or 10, or 20, which other features would be useful? Which, what other information I fail to capture that would be useful for predicting the target? By the way, this exact problem, which I'm gonna write in English, given a subset T of features, F1, Targets, labels, 
why, what other features would be useful? This is the hard question of the day currently in machine learning. If you go work in production, in a company and all that, and you do machine learning, a lot of the machine learning that's going on right now, any domain, text, articles, images, medical domain, songs, you name it, is not the algorithm. It's what am I missing in this data? How can I get better recommendations, better predictions, better clustering, better that? Uh, it's something I'm missing in the data. There are There's some research going on into algorithms. Uh, I can give you some ideas of that, but that's very high level, very fancy, and very little. Most of the productivity and industry is focused on what features do I need to, to improve my classifier. Okay, so given all that, let me start with this uh, margin analysis. <coughs> bridge between what we've been doing, boosting, and what we need to do next, which is focus on margins. Uh, so here's the other boost algorithm, right? What was it? H of x is the sum of t equal 1 to t uh, alpha t h t of x, where h t in here is going to be uh, decision sum. That is a one split decision tree. Uh, this could be made to work for any other weak learners, but for us, let's just focus on this idea of a decision stump. Remember? This is alpha 1 times h1 plus alpha 2 times h2, so on and so forth. That's the other boost algorithm. And now, um, what is margin? If you don't like the word margin, you can call it confidence. <laughs> On a data point, it will be um, y of x times h of x divided by the sum. So what is this? This is uh, the label. I'm also assuming here the labels are like in other boost, plus or minus one. Y of x times, uh, who is this? This is a sum from t equal one to t of alpha t h t of x. Um, I apply the sum the alpha t. So this is kind of a normalization here because I don't want margins to depend on how high the alpha t's in general are being picked. Somebody can take my other boost prediction and multiply all the alphas by 100, right? And then all the scores are multiplied by 100. In terms of a margin, remember the concept of a margin? This is the separation line or, or Conceptually speaking, this is the discriminator between the plus one and the minus one classes. Conceptually, I'm not talking about other boost specifically. And I say, if I have a point here, I'm going to predict plus one. Right? If I have a point here, I'm going to predict minus one. I want you to think of margins as how much confidence I have. The farther away from the prediction line, the, the, or the separation line. Let, let me actually draw this as a non-linear line. So, so this is my separation surface to be clear that I'm not talking about regression necessarily or neural networks. 
any classifier, any discriminatory classifier. Some points would be very close. I still predict minus one, because it's on that side, but I have low confidence, so it's too close to the border. Some points in here I predict minus one with high confidence, and so on and so forth. So I want you to think of this margin as kind of how far away is this point from the separation line. And there's a mathematical definition here. Is that corresponding to that thing? So why it's only going to dictate the size, right? So when this is correct? To be correct on the right side, I need y times h of x to be positive. Right? Because h of x dictates the side of prediction. If it's negative, I'm going to say minus. If it's positive, I'm going to say plus. And y dictates the true label. So if it's minus times minus or plus times plus, I'm correct. And when it's incorrect, it's when y times h of x, of course, that's y of x is the label for that point, is more than zero. Right? Hands up with me. Okay. Any questions? That's just a recap of what happened before. So if I have a positive, the concept of margin here includes whether I'm right or wrong. Because it's an analysis tool, it's not, it's not something that will change my algorithm. We're not talking about making any modification to other boost or regressions or nothing like this in here. We just analyze what happened. So if I predict that this is a minus one, I have the prediction minus one. And I have the truth, that's a y, which is also minus 1. And I'm saying I'm correct with high confidence. If the truth will be plus 1, it's I'm incorrect with high confidence. Right? So margins, I want, what do I want for the margins to be? What, what, what will say my algorithm, on what points my algorithm runs really well? large positive margins, right? So large positive margins means correct high confidence. How about large negative margins? The ones that are, this quantity is very negative. It's all the way to the other side of zero. <coughs> what is this? Outliers, this is incorrect. Uh, high confidence. So this is outliers or big mistakes, however you want to call it. This is something that, in, again, if you work in industry, definitely want to take a look at those to see how is that possible, right, to have such a high confidence on things that are wrong. That must be a good explanatory reason for that. Perhaps a data shift, perhaps a mislabeling, who knows what. And what is low uh, margin? So margin, an absolute value close to zero, either positive or negative. This corresponds to something like, OK, there's a band in here that is it's, it's like a nebula. Uh, points in here everybody can accept that they are too close to the separation line. They could go either way. There's the patient that I'm not sure he has some beginning of diabetes, but not really diabetes. So now it could go either way. Or an email that's not clear, it's a spam email or not, right? So that's low confidence. So there could be quite a few reasons to have low confidence on data. Yes. Can we say that margins are a good way to evaluate the quality or performance of our ML model? Yes. Model? yes. But why don't we you see it very commonly? Like, with all this accuracy, I don't know, this sort of thing, but we don't see. So he brings a very good point. Why is it that we use accuracy as performance, which is clearly accuracy does the same to this minus one as with this minus one as with this minus one? As far as accuracy concerns, those are all in the minus side. But margins would say, wait a minute, uh, this is very close in here, 
So you kind of get a 50-50 there, no matter what the truth is. If you're right, you get a little bit of credit. If you're wrong, you get a little bit of penalty because it's kind of 50-50. But in here, if you're right, you get a lot of credit. And if you're wrong, you get a big penalty. Accuracy doesn't do that. Accuracy gives you one point for everything, no matter how close this is. So his point is very good. In terms of uh, performance, what do we care about? I think it depends on who asked that question. If I'm a manager at the hospital, I mean, I just, if, how well the algorithm goes in terms of accuracy corresponds to how much money you make. Not me, the hospital, right? In terms of a machine learning engineer that debugs the algorithm, margins are much more, much more useful than accuracy itself because I'm looking at them and I'm gonna say, of course I can make, I, I'm not, I'm not, I can't do much, or I can do different things about the mistakes I do close to the margin. That's a little bit of tuning perhaps. And I can do very little about, or, or I need drastical changes for points that are far away. If, I, if I'm to try to get this one right, because it's wrong, it's a minus one, that's really a plus one, I gotta massively change my algorithm. A, a little bit of tuning won't move this line over an outline, right? But a little bit of tuning might correct for some points that are around the margins. Active learning is doing that little bit of tuning after a while, right? Active learning picks the points nearby and tries to move the line accordingly to those points. That's a little bit of tuning. It's not changing completely the classifier. So from a machine learning standpoint of view as an engineer, margins are a better tool to look at your algorithm than straight accuracy. Improving the margin doesn't mean necessarily improving the accuracy. I may have the same classification, just with a higher confidence. I, I described this before, the people lines that do a classification, picking the position, the line in the middle, give me better confidence. But doesn't it mean that it might work better for tests? It does. If I have better margins, even though I have the same performance training accuracy, I may actually get better at certain test points. But again, I, I, don't, I won't change classification far away from the line. It will just change around there. So how does this go? This is the other boost size and prediction, right? This is the label. And this is dividing by alpha t just to prevent this fact of I don't want to change my margin just by multiplying the alpha t with the random scalar. I want to be independent. If these are already normalized, the sum of the alpha t, the absolute values to sum to one, which might happen in other boost, then I don't need to worry about this denominator. Right. So then, um, if I now look at this, this uh, classifier, I want to relate the margins with the features. This is uh, H T, this is H, H1, H2. Now, because the statistician stumps, every one of them, it's a feature and a threshold. That's how decision stumps work. I pick something in the data, I split by this, I go either left or right. So implicitly, every H corresponds to a feature to, let's say, two here, because it's not the second feature in the data is the feature that the second classifier picks and the threshold. We know that, that every single decision stump is one. So I would like to relate the notion of margins, which is how confident I am, with the notion with the features. My Again, this, you have to think of this as an analysis tool. I'm not planning to change other boost at all. Other boost is already trained. It's a done deal. I'm not retraining others. Whatever perf performance training, testing, it's all done. I just want to look at it and understand what is happening in others. So I want to think of this as an analysis. So what's happening here is that feature two might be used more than once. Right? It's totally possible that some classifier here uh, uses again feature two, perhaps with a different threshold. This is a uh, say this is feature 
So this is a feature two. That's a feature, uh, you know, ten with threshold ten. It's possible that feature two is the same as feature ten. Right? The second feature, the second decision stump, uses the same feature as the ten decision stump. I'm not, I'm not saying that's mandatory to happen. I'm just saying we have no control in Adaboost over what decision stamp is going to be picked at the round. Might be the same feature that has been used the second round with different threshold for a different purpose. So I'm trying to group those features into how many times each one of them has been used. Right. So let's say. H here, right? This is an ensemble. That's how we call it, an ensemble of decision trees. NF is the number of times this has been used. Now, the sum of these NFs has got to be T, right? Because if feature 1 is used one time, feature 2, one time, feature 3, seven times, some features zero times, the number of times each feature is used has to correspond to how many uh, decision stumps I have here because every decision stump uses exactly one feature. And I can rewrite the classifier. Uh, let me see here before we do that. H, F, J. In order to do rewrite H of X as a double sum. So this sum is the same as this sum, term by term, but it's been ordered differently. In here, what's the order? Who is H1, who's H2, who's H3? Well, that's Adabus. So who's H1? The first week learned that Adabus asked for. Who's H2? Changes the distribution, blah, blah. Ask again for a week learner, right? So this is a greedy ordering. Ada boost picks always the most useful, uh, unless you do the random features, typically when you train you get what's the most useful decision stamp or weak learner right now. And then you update the distribution and you move on to the next right now, and right now, and right now, and little by little you get to some progress, right? Gradient boosting does the same, it doesn't, doesn't change the distribution, instead it asks what's the best feature right now for that residual that I have. So that's the order here. It's the order in which I pick up those H classifiers to make the most out of the training. What's the order feature here? In here, the whole thing is grouped by the features. It says, pick feature one, feature one in the data set. Feature one is this one here. Right here, that's feature one. And say, what is the second sum? These are all the decision stumps in that ensemble that use feature one. Right? So it says, okay, this one is using feature one, this one, and that one. Thus, I have three decision stumps using feature one. So it says, okay, once you pick that feature, go over all the uses of that feature and sum up. The, the, these terms are the same as these terms. It's just grouped by the feature. And then I can write the margin. As that.
So I, I just rewrote the numerator as the, the sum I have here, I replace it with this sum now, which is the same exact sum of terms, just grouped differently, times the label, right? And I have, still have the denominator of this. And I would like to say, I want to define a, func a function that's similar to the margin, x, but the margin that comes kind of due only to a particular feature. This is the margin of the whole classifier. Look at it. How can I dis declare a margin only based on one feature? So that's my point here. So I'm going to look at that formula and say, how about uh, I can't have the sum over the features, right? Because if a margin is now this concept of a margin due to one feature, if you want the conceptual explanation is how much do I move away from the separation, not with the whole classifier, but only due to one particular feature in the data. That's going to come from the decision stump that used the, that, that particular feature, right? And some, some decision stump will push me one way, and some decision stumps might push me the other way. In the end, I get somewhere with the sum, right? So in here, I won't have this sum, but I'll have that particular sum over all usages of that feature, because I already picked the feature here. And now, what are the alphas that I should, this is all the alphas in the ensemble. Only the ones that appear in that feature, right? So how do I write that? From j equal one to, to the number of appearances of that feature of alpha fj absolute one. So this definition for now is just taking the big margin definition and kind of breaking up into margins due to feature one, margin due to feature two, margin due to feature three. And I have a theorem. So I won't do the proof. Proof is very easy. Just a few lines of math in here. Um, I have a theorem that says, um, there is a way to obtain the margin of x, that this margin, as a combination of the margins due to features. It's a sum for all features of some coefficient, which I didn't talk about yet. That's a new thing. I'm going to call it gamma, as in my notes here, times the margin f of x. Again, the proof of this is just a linear manipulation of terms. There's nothing fancy to it. But who's gamma? Gamma is exactly this ratio. Is how ma how big are the alpha coefficients for feature f, which is they are here. Those are all the boosting coefficients that are on one particular feature as a fraction of the total. So this would be the sum for j equal 1 to nf of alpha fj divided by the sum for all t equal 1 to t of all alpha t's. So these coefficients here are a subset of those here. They are all part of the ensemble. The ones in the numerator are only the ones that correspond to a given feature f. At the bottom is all of them. So these gammas, obviously, will have to sum to 1 because each gamma takes a bunch of alphas out of the total. They are per feature. So if I go through all the features, sum of gamma f will have to sum to one. So now that I have this theorem here, it tells me if you look at the margin, that's my confidence, kind of how does it correspond with confidences that are coming from different features. Um, so now, uh, let's talk a little bit more about this gamma.
selecting features which has the most common? Uh, again, for now, I would like to think of this as an analysis tool. If I do selection, obviously I have a purpose with it, right? Selection makes sense if you want to run an algorithm on selected features or do something with them. But for me, right now, I'm, I'm going to move in that direction. But right now, I don't want to retrain Adalyst. It's done. It's in production. It's running. I want to understand something about Adalyst. So my fundamental question right, right now is, what is the usefulness or utility of feature F. So very often, if you work as a data scientist or as a machine learning engineer, you'll be asked this question, what features are useful? People will give you a data set and say, what features are the ones that give the right predictions? A, the, a harder question is the one I mentioned before, what features I would need I need, but I don't have yet. That's a much harder question because you may not even have access to raw data, so you don't know. But this is a more reasonable question. Out of the features I gave you, which ones are the ones that do the job? So we already have a selection. Boosting, especially with decision trees, clearly already made a selection, right? If I have, like I said, 50,000 features, I run boosting for how many rounds did you run out of boosting? 100 rounds, 200 rounds, something like that. Right? So 200 rounds with decision stamps, that's at most 200 features. It's already a pretty clear selection right there. So if somebody asks you what features are you using, oh, those 200, right? The other ones I'm not using at all. But out of those 200, is there a way to rank them? If your boss says, okay, you have those 200, but I want a ranked list of features. I want, for this particular task, features ranked by important or usefulness for doing the prediction. By the way, this is an absolute critical question in the medical domain. Whatever the task is, predict something or something or something else. Predict whether the patient comes back, predict the drug, predict the ICD codes, predict the procedure, predict how long it's gonna live, whatever. The fundamental question is, if you were to rank the features by their impact to the prediction, for ability to tell the truth. What are the dominant features? Because insurance companies are crazy about this question. You ever fill the, the formula, the questionnaire with like 60 questions? Well, somebody designed that questionnaire, fine. But from an insurance company or a bank, it's all a matter of estimating risk, right? Banks and insurance companies are very, very mathematical entities. Their job is to estimate when people are going to die, how much money they're going to need to spend on health insurance, how many car wrecks they're going to be, uh, you know, what they're going to be their income three years from now, on and on and on. It's all a mathematical question of estimating what matters. So it asks you 60 questions. It turns out that not all 60 questions are that relevant. And even further, how you take 60 answers and make a risk prediction out of it, right? So the way the banks figure out how much loan to give you, or insurance companies figure out what quote to put on your premium for your house, for your life, for your whatever car, it's a very mathematical question. And they have to depend on this. What features matter here? Salary is, of course, a big feature for, say, a bank mortgage loan. There was a question. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, if you have a ranking of the utilities of these features, that seems more important when it's expensive to collect the data, so you can collect less data on your prediction and still get almost the same accuracy. Is that true? It's true, but different problems have different expenses. For some data, it's not expensive at all to collect features. For some data, it's very expensive. If it's a medical test, like a CT scan, those cost like $4,000 a piece, right? So. It, you, the whole logistics of doing this in these cases. If it's a measurement of some kind, there's some easy measurements and there's some really complicated measurements. You have to go in bad weather and you know put a sensor in there and all that it becomes complicated. Uh, won't the data be biased since we are increasing the distribution for each data point in ADA Boost? And since we're taking the, the weightage of the features, won't that make a difference? Because the feature that might affect that data point 
I, 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 I need to understand your question better, but my initial answer, reaction, is no. Other boost fee doesn't, doesn't um, so you're saying the way you measure features here is biased. Yeah. It's biased in the sense of I'm using, I'm looking at features that other boost selected, and other boost select the features to deal with the hard data points. I don't mind that bias. In some sense, I don't consider it a bias. In the sense of if the data is difficult in a particular sense, this is very task dependent. I'm obviously depending on what the labels are. I'm not just looking at the data with my labels. Both the analysis and the other boost algorithm are tasked with predict these particular labels. If something is difficult in there, of course the features that address that difficulty will be a lot more used, right? Whatever the difficulty is, that is the biased data points that have high weights in Adapus, they if they depend on only three features, Adapus <coughs> is gonna use those three features a lot. But that's okay. My analysis should also say I need those three features a lot, right? Because those are the ones that make a determination in difficult cases. And that's what the same a data scientist will do in a practical problem. If I do predictions for medical the, the, you know, documents, and there are three features that are absolutely critical, then I need to know that those are the three features that matter. Right? Uh, back to his question, it's not just a matter of collecting the feature or not as a whole, it's a matter of making sure you have it. Data is noisy, if there's missing data points, which they always are, you can tolerate very easily missing data on the features that are not that important. Not to say, not even this does 200, right? If you look at the ensemble and I have missing values for other features than those 200, I don't even care, right? Because my, my, my prediction will not even gonna call for those features. But when you have missing values in the important features, that's a problem. Um, so, how do we measure this feature utility? Again, for other boost, for a particular task that is the labels are given. Um, can I say y f times margin So this is kind of the proportion in the margin, if you, if you look at that theorem in there, that's uh, sum over the features. So the confidence I get, which is the margin, is broken up into confidence obtained feature by feature. So this is kind of how much of the confidence comes from that feature F. But the problem is, is this is for one data point. Right, because this whole thing it's based on one point. It's saying this point right here, right? A utility of a feature cannot be measured on how it does on one point. Although sometimes you get that question again in practical data science, your boss or manager or domain expert will isolate five patients out of a cohort of you know 100,000 and say, what would be the feature that matters for these five patients? then it's a much more down to a particular data point than a general property of the data, right? If I am to look at five patients, it's a different story than if I look as a whole at the whole problem. So sometimes you need to do that. Sometimes, uh, depending on what the problem is, you're gonna need to pick on some data points. And, and if you do that, then that's a data point. So we can try to average this, right? That is uh, usefulness. Will that help us to choose the best features also? Like if the doctor tells us the data is marginalized on, it's more common among the five data points. So as an analysis tool, we're not gonna redo other boost, but it will help us machine learning engineer, scientists, to talk to the domain experts. You go to a domain expert, like a doctor or a lawyer, you can't show this math. They, they're not gonna follow it, right? 
but you can tell them, hey, your most important three features are the following three. And for this particular case of patients, which are only like 20 patients, there's another two features that are very important, that and that. So I think that at the minimum, it opens a communication between us, the data scientists, and a person who doesn't understand machine learning, but can easily relate why blood pressure is important for that disease, for example. So we use you guys are not going to let me finish this. Lecture. <laughs> <laughs> I'm abandoning the plan. So we use, we use margin as a post-classification analysis concept. But we said that on active learning, we are, we are going to use margin to decide on closeness to the discriminative blah, blah, blah. So then without labels, how are we going to be able to use margins? To no, we have labels. Okay. Now on active learning, oh. without labels, how are we going to use the concept of margin to... But why, why are we worried about without labels? Because... We have labels all the way here. Right. In active learning, when we're choosing next three person data points from the data set, we don't have labels for them. No, but you choose to label them, right? You say, in active learning is slightly different than this, but it's very related. In active learning, I have a point here, and I, I don't have the label. Yeah. <laughs> But when I choose it, uh -huh. means I choose to label it, right? That, that's the purpose of active learning. I'm picking a point yes. that once I label it, or I pay for somebody to label it, I get to add it to my training set. Uh, let me answer this question first. So in active learning, we don't know the label, uh -huh. but it's very related to the concept of margin, right? Uh -huh. Not having the label, we're missing whether it's a, a plus or minus margin because the label being plus or minus one will flip the sign. But we, don't, we know the confidence. How, how close? Right? That we know. We don't know if, if this point in here, it might be either a, a small minus or a small plus. So either way, we, we know it's a small confidence, but we don't know the label. This point here, again, we wouldn't know the label when we choose it, but we know it's a big margin. If it end up incorrect, it's highly incorrect. So we don't need labels. We don't labels, we can't have No, the point of active learning is to say, why label this point and not this point? Yes. The meaning here is, very likely, this will end up being a minus. And then, we haven't learned much. It's not in good information for my algorithm. Once I throw this point back into the training set, it's not going to influence things that much. My algorithm is already highly confident. On the other hand, if this is a wrong point, which is unlikely because I have such a confidence on it, but if it's a wrong point, it requires huge changes to my algorithm to make it work, right? So depending on where are we in the active learning process, are we early on where we are, in principle, allowing big changes, or we are down the line already where we probably don't want to make big changes to the algorithm, right? This point will usually not be so useful. There's also an information theoretic metric that can decide, given the chances of being a plus or minus, how useful this point would be. This, you can see, it's always gonna be useful because whether it's a minus or plus, it will tune a little bit the classification line, so it's almost definitely gonna help. This in here has a big chance of not helping. That's why active learning goes that way. So it's related to the concept of margin. I was just going to say, without the label, you can find the magnitude of the margin, even if you don't know the yes. Plot, yes. Yes. Right, but in active learning, the you plan is... The mark, you just need the magnitude. Right, the plan is to change the algorithm. So presumably, once you retrain it, you have slightly different margins. Because once I retrain it, I get different alpha coefficients. My plan for right now is, or was, only to deal as an analysis tool. I'm not necessarily planning to change it, although of course once we see the analysis, you can decide to make changes, right? But rather to understand how useful a feature is for my algorithm. I cannot emphasize enough how important this question is in practice, especially in production where efficiency and margins means money. You wanna make yourself well known with a good name in the first few months of your first job, make some money to your manager, okay? So that, that's by far the best way to make a name, right? So 
machine learning is a lot of big data with a lot of big uh, hardware with a lot of big algorithms like neural networks, right? Very fancy stuff. Nobody can figure out what's going on. That's why it's not that easy to answer what are the top three features here. Not to mention people have multi-label problems. They don't just predict one thing. They have their data, medical records, or videos, or songs. They try to predict many, many things. So now I have another problem, which is, OK, is this feature good only for that label prediction, which is what we're talking about here. Here, the labels are fixed. But imagine I have many labels that I'm predicting, like these multi-label classes, where a data point, a, a patient, could have many diseases, could have many behaviors, could have many drugs, and could have many outcomes. So I'm trying to predict all of that. Is there some feature that's important for many predictions? Or I need to collect for each you know, prediction or classifier different features? So a lot of the problems you're going to have as data scientists is in the feature space. OK? Are we all ready to move on. So, useful for all data points, let's just average the thing, right? Uh, y, the gamma, sorry, F times the sum over margin F of the psi. So what am I doing here? I'm averaging yf is a constant. You can tell right away. This coefficient is just the weight of that feature divided by the total. And here, I'm doing this ratio, but I'm doing a sum over all data points in the numerator. That's the margins corresponding to that feature f. And the sum over all data points at the denominator, that's get all the margins. Uh, this is an ad hoc thing, the last step. You can imagine some other heuristics to do this. The point is, this is an exercise in your next homework. I would like you to go back to other books. You don't have to rerun it if you save the whole classifier, alpha, and all that. And answer in the spam base on house data or whatever, which are the features that I use the most in my classifier. And I'm sure you're going to see, if you pay attention to this, no matter what data set you use, this will be a highly skewed distribution. Regression, naive base, Adabus, decision trees, neural networks. You're not going to see a uniform distribution over many features, even for 50 features. You'll see that there's two or three or four that have big weights or big importance or big margins, whatever you want to call it, and some other ones that only add very tiny bits to the classifier. So back to the selection problem, I could go back and say, what if I pick the top 10 features only and just stick with those and ignore the others. How much performance do I lose? Or how much margins do I lose? That's also a pertinent question for, for, for a lot of the problems today. If I'm to restrict myself to 100 features, or 20 features, or five features, or only the features that I have easily to collect, the ones that are easy to get. You know, I don't want to do the CT scans that are expensive, although that increases my performance. How much of a performance I get if I don't do those expensive ones? So that's the analysis that I have here. My internal pedagogic plan is to introduce the margins now and play with them for a week so that next week when we talk about support vector machines, we already have the margins fresh in our mind because we're going to need them very explicitly when we do support vector machines. So my plan for today was to do this quickly okay, and do PCA next. So that's obviously not possible. But let's start talking about PCA, and we'll have to finish next time. This note is online, of course. You don't need to. The proof is very easy. You just need to figure out how to go back to your other boost classifier and collect those margins out of there. So let's start PCA. (coughs) 
I, I want to start actually with that matrix. Let me erase more. Uh, now, the good thing about PCA is that today there's so many classes that teach PCA. If you take data mining, you study PCA. If you take any AI, you study PCA. If you do clustering, you do PCA. You know, some physics engineering classes, they teach PCA, right? So chances are you've seen PCA before. I'm not gonna make a big deal out of it. 10 years ago in this class, PCA was an entire week. Now it's 45 minutes, okay, less. <laughs> But PCA is very important. It has this amazing ability to deal with the linear algebra correlation. Unbelievable, I would say. But keep in mind that in reality, that linear algebra exact correlation, a feature being uh, you know, the, the linear combination of some other features, you cannot hope for that to be exact. There's no way in data something like that will happen with mathematical precision. So we need to keep that in mind when we use PCA, which is a very powerful tool, that you can't hope for the exact linearity in data. So machine learning, the question becomes is, okay, PCA is great, but we need to allow flexibility in order for my classifier to do something with it. So now a little bit of theory about PCA. I have this data and um, This data is n data points by d features, right? In PCA, we have no labels. So let's establish that from the beginning. PCA, no labels. So I'm, I'm, whatever PCA does, it's only in the feature space. There is some version of PCA, in fact, many versions, that deal with labels, which are far more interesting for supervised classification, things like ICA. ICA is a version of PCA that says, I'm gonna do what PCA does, reduce the feature space, obtaining linear combination of features, but keeping an eye on the labels. Everything I do, I wanna do by thinking what's useful for predictions. PCA doesn't look at the labels, so whatever it does, it's independent of what you wanna do. ICA is much better for classification because it, at the minimum, doesn't throw out interesting stuff for those labels. So ICA looks at the labels. So PCA of X, ICA of X and Y. That is the same purpose, just paying attention to the labels. So uh, let's start with the intuition. Um, the plan in here, so the task, is to represent matrix X on uh, fewer dimensions than D. Right. That's what I want. I don't like D dimensions, I want less. So the plan, the end result, is something that is a, a matrix. It's going to be N, because I still have all the data points by uh, T, where T is, you guys know this sign, a lot smaller, a lot smaller than T. So that's what I want. So just to follow intuition, uh, what happens if T is zero? <laughs> so T is one, but let's say, okay, let's say extreme, T is one. What would that look like? Yeah, n by one, so this is still x1 up to xn, right? They're my data points. But everyone now has one value, right? There's a v1, v2, everyone is now represented by one value. One value, a real number, right? Scalar. So back to my original, what is t equals zero? So I want to think about it in terms a little bit of, of geometry. In this case, what space do I have? I mean, dimensional space. In this space, I have a zero dimensional zero. space. That's one point. One dimensional space. 
that is one point. Zero. One, one, one point, but that point, it's, it's still a vector, right? I mean, I mean, I can still have a vector. So one point will be uh, one data point. So if I tell you, you got to replace the whole data set with one vector, do the best representation you can. Which one will be that vector that represents this point? Vertical zero. Hmm? Vertical zero. Vertical zero. Vertical zero. Vertical zero. Vertical one. We establish that we're going to need to produce a value for each data point. The value can be different, but it's only one value. Every data point gets replaced by a real number. For t equal two, every data point will be two numbers. Right? For t equal three, it will be three numbers. For t equals zero, you can't have a value per data point, but you can have a vector, one point, that represents everything. So I, I want to bring up the notion of, of dimensionality this way, which is n points, versus a notion of dimensionality this way, which is the number of features. Uh, t, equal, t equal 2 will be x1 to xn. Everybody has two values, right? This is v11, v12, vn1, vn2, so on and so forth, right? In here, I have one data point. Um, so how is this going to look? Everybody, 1 to n, is represented by the same value. B, 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 B. Right. That, that's not really a vector because it's only one value. Now, this, in terms of representation, there is the capacity, whether I use two values per data point, one value per data point, zero values per data point, and then there is the what you actually do with that value. So again, I'm reformulating my question. You can produce one value, that's a real number, that, 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 that's the variability of this data set. But then you can use it in any way you want to represent the data. So what would you do? You have a question? I was going to say, this is like a minimal standard set or a standard set for a space, right? Uh, we're not at all imposing here that those values have to be part of the original matrix. I don't know if that's what you mean by spanning set. So there is no constraint whether you use one value per point or two values per point or zero values per point or whatever, that those values have to be from the original data. We could choose any values we want. No, I was kind of just All right. So for one value, as in terms of variability, I mean, I don't have any Variance, all the points in here will be represented by the same thing. That, that's what it means, right? So what will be that same thing? Would we want this to be different per data set so that it reflects some information sure. about the data set? Sure, but we only have one data set to worry about right now. I'm just saying, in a geometrical sense, we look at those points, right? If you have no ability to distinguish them, but you can pick a representant, something that you know, speaks for the whole data set. Because that's what it comes down to, right? I, I cannot distinguish the points, but I can pick one point to be you know, like the universal representation of this data set. Which point would that be? Again, I'm not restricted to be part of the X. It doesn't have to be one of them. <coughs> I'm definitely asking this way too complicated because the answer is super easy. Uh, right, so which one is that? Yeah, which is the average. So this would be, in here, uh, the mean, right? Uh, the, what is it, 1 over n, sum of the xi, right, that's the mean. And the representation would be every single point gets represented as the mean. Say xi, but if we're doing a sum for each 
So, okay, we take the sum, it's the mean of all the data points, or all of the features. Right, so okay. this, this is D values, and right. now somebody could ask, wait a minute, you told me I can never use them values, but you just use D values here. I, I want to distinguish the, the number of different values as rows versus number of different values as columns. There's a different notion of, okay, how do you deal with the columns? I'd like to postpone that discussion a little bit. My, what I want you to take from here is the, how much variability I allow in my data. In D equals zero, how much variance of variability is in this representation? Zero. All the points are that. Now, back to his comment. Maybe I don't represent this in D dimensions. Maybe I pick some average and I represent it in some other space, some other way. Point is, no matter what I pick, every single point will be represented by that thing. So all my points are identical. How do I choose to write a mu down that comes down to do you run really one down D values or not? In here, how much variability I have in T equal one? I have one real value per point, right? That's what I have. So I'm gonna try to go back to t equal one and say, I think what I wanna get is for every xi is the mu, the mean as a reference point plus a i times So T1, I'm going to call this a line, uh, or one dimension. The line is E, line direction. So what I mean here, this is a scalar value per What I mean, every x i in here, here's the mean, mu. Here's the line. This is E. E will figure out geometrically. E determines the line, but nothing else. And perhaps determines also the direction, which that way or the other way. And now, the representation of my data set on this line, it's only dimensional. It's determined by these scalars, right? So the mu is here. This point is going to be, the norm of E is 1, because E is a tensor. It's only given the direction. It's a unidimensional vector that only determines the line. So you can think of E as a size 1 vector. And then how much do you go on the line? It determines by this AI. Right? So a point x1 might be cor corresponding now to a1 here, and the point x2 might be a2. a2 is this uh, segment here, right? because it's multiplied by 1. And then a point uh, x3 might be here, that's a3, that's negative. So every single point in my data set will be represented on a line by these scalars. I have to determine the line. E. Again, E will be which direction the line goes. And given the line, I have to determine which one is A1, A2, A3. How does X1 correspond to A1? So when you say E, we thought it was a size 1 vector, you mean on a different coordinate plane than the XIs are on, right? Because it would have to be T dimensional to point on a line in T dimensional space. Right. So I, I, let's think for now in the same space. So. E as a vector, what he's saying is E would have to be something like. <coughs> like on this line, it looks like 1, 1, right? Uh, yeah. So. Out a line of 45 degree, but if you change the coordinate plane, you could express it in terms of 1. I don't know if I want to change the coordinate plane, because I don't think so. I think it's the same space is a d-dimensional vector of size e equal 1. Oh, so like it, oh, it's norm is 1. Right. Okay, I, so I, I thought you meant it was like right. 1 by 1 scaling. 
So if I if I have to look at the points, right? X1 might be here. And this, at least intuitively, geometrically, would be the projection, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it has to be the projection. I'm saying if you think geometrically, how would you represent a point on a line? How do you represent points on their coordinates? You take the point and you draw a perpendicular to find out the coordinate on that axis, right? Suppose I tell you this is my axis now. How do you represent x2 might be here? That's going to project in a2. x3 might be here. That's a3. Now, x4 is here. What happened with x4? a3 is the same as a4, right? As far as the representation goes, because x3 and x4 have the same perpendicular here, they will be represented by the same number, which means after my representation, I won't be able to distinguish between x3 and x4, even though they are two different data points. Once I represent them this way, if I choose the perpendiculars, that's going to be identical points now. And that was with me. Further explanation. I'm making some assumptions here just to start the process. I'm saying, look, I have this big space of the axis. I'm picking a line, only dimensional line. And a natural way to think about it is to draw the projections of each point to the line to obtain that. But I'm not saying that we're going to draw the projections. Maybe we will, maybe not. In any case, every point will have to be associated with somebody on the line, even if it's not a projection. Maybe x3 gets associated here. The point of fully dimensional representation is that every point will be mapped somewhere on the line. And because it's mapped somewhere on the line, it's of this form. It's the center plus some way to go that way or some way to go that way, right? Anybody on this line is a fixed point in the center that corresponds to zero. And then a scalar that says, how far do I need to go on the line in, in either positive or negative sense? Again, I'm emphasizing this. I'm not saying they have to be geometric projections. Whatever they are, they're going to be of this form. But for drawing purposes, I'm going to use geometric projections to make it more intuitive. Hands up, who's with me again? All right, progress. <coughs> so what do I want to do? I want to represent the data on one line. Obviously, I have to decide the line. But once I decide the line, I have to decide who gets projected where on the line. I say those will end up being perpendicular projections because I know the theory of MC and all that and minimizing square loss. And for as much geometry I know, I'm pretty sure they're going to end up being perpendiculars. But even if that's pretty clear, are you guys believing me that those will end up being perpendiculars from the math? We still have the problem of where, which line to use. Which line should we use? I mean, that has to do more with the purpose. What do we want? Even if we believe math will prove projections, what line makes a good representation of the data? And what line makes a bad representation of the data? So if you were to choose, here's my data set. Uh, here's the points, right? Let's say our intuition, which is not proven yet, is that every point will be kind of projected in its perpendicular, right? It will be the geometrical projection on the line. Every single point gets replaced with its perpendicular on the line. And that means, again, points that have the same perpendicular will be now very close, right? So even though the points are far away, I'm just going to end up with the same representation for both of them because I'm trying to restrict everything in one line. That's going to happen no matter what, right? If I do from 300 dimensions into one, some points will be mapped very close, and they were not that close to start with. I have to admit, I mean, I have to be ready for that to happen. But do you think this line will have to pass through view? That's the center of the data. I can choose a line that has the same perpendiculars, right? Because if you look at these lines, these lines are parallel. So all the AIs will be the same on this line, right? All the offset from, from the mean will be the same, except this line doesn't pass to mu. Should I choose a line that passes to mu or one that doesn't pass to mu? 
again, every line that doesn't pass from you has an equivalent line that passes from you with the same exact AIs, the only difference, and the same exact direction, E, the only difference is the offset. So for any line that has a direction and some AIs, I can do a similar line that has the same E direction and the same AI scalars, but mu will be part of the line. So I have this question is, should mu be part of the line? And a more general question, which direction the line should take? Because now, if, if it passes through mu, I can imagine doing different, I can do projection on this line, or projection on this line, so on and so forth, right? Some lines would be better than others for representing the data set. Which line should I use? Uh, can we, like, the distance between the point and the line is the error is what you said, right? The distance, the perpendicular distance? Yeah. Right. That's kind of, yeah, that's kind of geometrically uh, how far a point has to be moved as far as the representation goes. Point was here, now its projection is here. Uh, point was here, now its position is here. So in some sense, this is how much the point has changed via this representation. So we just rotate the line, right, until that error is minimized. Uh, the error overall, you mean. Right. So he's saying the line you want is the one that minimizes these, these errors overall. Yes. That's a good idea. What else I could do? Yes. I mean, if you're reducing dimensionality of the space, right, you want to pick values that don't that maintain like the distance between the points, like don't rotate like your vectors as you're as you're reducing the space, right? Distance between points, you mean if the distance is this one is D, distance in projection has to be also D. Not necessarily. No. I mean that would be a good goal that's impossible to achieve geometrically. Maybe some sort of ranking. So you can preserve distances with projections, but you can say big distances yeah. correspond to big difference in projections, and small distances correspond to small distance in projection. That's a good goal. What else could I want from this line to do? Do we see the maximum number of points that occupy the same position on the line? So, it can be like so you, he's saying, I don't want all those different points to be projected on the same thing. As far as the presentation goes, that's very important, differentiation, right? I want things that are similar to kind of, I'm allowing them to get to the same point, but things that are not so similar, I would like to go in different points. Okay, so there's a better way to say this, but the idea is good. Yes. Can you look at this as like a linear regression and try and maximize R squared? R squared? The correlation between the, or not R squared, minimize, just again, minimizing the mean square error. Right, so minimizing the mean square error is the difference between a point and its projection. I think that has been said. Maybe you, it's this distance or this, that distance, whatever. But if I tell you I have a data set and I'm looking just at the projections, I don't tell you the data set, but I show you the projections, what do you think makes a better representation? Yeah. I show you two sets of projections. Here's one set, this set, and here's another set. Let's pick another line. Let's pick this line here. And say, project every point on this line now. So now I get points, this is here, that's here, that's here, that's here, this is here. I project everything in here. And I get on this line those projections, and on this line I get these projections. The same points, perpendicular projected here. And I don't show you the points, but I give you this set of AIs, I'm assuming both lines passes to mu, so mu is irrelevant. E is two directions, some direction and some other direction. And I give you the AI sets. I say, here's the projections as scalars. Projection is how far away from the mean you went for a point. This, this is AI. Here's the, the projections on this line, and here's the projections on this line, separate. Which one would you say is better? How do you look at this AI and say, that's better? Okay. Maybe like the the highest average distance from you on the projection. Highest average distance from you. Yes. Sparse. Uh, I think he. I, I think he's what you want to say is correct, but what came out. Because oh. <laughs> we really don't care, you know, like average. I don't know. 
So I have a mu, and he's saying the farther points are from mu, the better. But keep in mind, a mu is the average. So right. Not everything can be far away from mu in one direction. It has to be far away in yeah, both yeah, directions. Of course. Yeah. Okay. So how do we say that more mathematically then? I think that's correct. Maximize what? Sum of the i's. Sum of the i's? Oh, variance. Absolute value. Variance. Yes. Variance, yes. So maximizing variance is what you want to say. Okay, back to what you said, right? He's saying, if you show me two projections, one that has large variance and one that has small variance, probably the one of large variation has a better representation power. So there's an extreme case that we can look at. Suppose my points, my actual points, are actually on a line. I don't know that, but they are linearly correlated, collinear, geometrically speaking. If I pick a line that's parallel with that line, this is the original axis. What's going to happen now with the points when they get projected? There's transformed. There's just a shift. This has exactly the same representation power as the original one, right? Because these points here are just the same as those. What happens if I pick this line? So this is a very good projection line. But uh, what about if I pick this? This is E1, this is E2, a different line. Where are the points now represented in here? Everybody's projected in this point. So now I lose all the representation ability because all my data set has been collapsed to one point. Versus in this other case, I have effectively an equivalent representation to the original. Of course, this is an extreme example. But maximizing variance, it's a goal or task heuristic that implicitly saying, I'm going to capture as much as I can from the original data set in one dimension. I'm still constrained to be in one dimension. So that, that's a good plan. Uh, I would like to write down these two objectives that have been stated. The, the, I, you guys said many, but this is the two that I like. So one is to say, which E? Right. So uh, I can uh, minimize uh, regression loss, regression square loss. That was J, I think, I would call it. And that was, um, let me say, is the sum for I equal 1 to N of mu plus AKE. Right, that's my new representation. Every point is represented as how far do I move from mu on the line, right? Remember x1, instead of x1, it's a1 now. You guys following me? This is the critical part of the whole PCA, this drawing right here. I'm changing x1 to be represented by some scalar, which is how far do I go to get on the line the representant for x1. Of course, I can go this way or I can go that way, but I scalars because I'm only moving on a line. So that's my new representation minus the point itself. Uh, okay. Square. So this is a way to say I want to minimize how close is the original point xk that was here versus the new point, which is mu plus a1 times e. Right? It's this point right here, geometry. Measuring that square. Mean k equals one to m. Yes. Okay. That's what I mean. I usually use i, but my notes here use k, so I'm going to stick with k. Usually i for data. Makes sense. I want to minimize the square average of how close this is again the new representation of x k on line uh, e. E determines the line direction, and this is the original xk. Uh, another proposal was maximize variance 
of projection. Uh, who's that? What's the variance? Mu plus a k, right? That that was the the point, right? Minus the expected of mu plus a k e squared. Is that variance? Variance is expected of the difference between the value minus the average value squared. So the values I'm measuring variance on are what, what values? These AIs. Remember my, my test, I gave you two sets of AIs, and I'm asking which one's better. That doesn't include the X case, just two XIs. So you, somebody says, measure the variance, and whichever has higher variance, that's the one you want. So how do I do this? I'm um, having trouble with the solution of the between square loss and the variance. Like, what's the difference between the square loss and the variance? Between this and this? Yeah. So mathematically, I don't know if you ask mathematically, I'm going to post like, the like, math. It's generally like on the pictures. Conceptually. Yeah. So I think both ideas were good. Both ideas were saying, the first one is saying, I want the points, original points, to be as close as possible as their representants. Of course, it's an average over all the points. So it's like take the, taking those distances and say, I want those to be small. I want my new points. Still, I have n points. This n AIs here. I want those points to be as close as possible to the original points, which means I take the difference and I average over all the points. And you square the difference. Right, I square the difference yeah. to make the math easier. Okay. The other one is saying, look, if you just look at the AIs to capture the most of the information in the original data set, you need higher variance. Because if you have a small variance, it means you collapsed everything to one point. The more variance, that's still a heuristic. I mean, you can create a data set with very large variance for which the representation is very bad, right? So variance is just comparing the AIs. Right, variance is only looking at these AIs. I mean, it knows the mu and the e, but it doesn't know anything about the original points. Okay. So it's saying, can I create by hand a data set for which the maximum variance is actually a very bad representation? I can, by picking points at the extremes and they all get, uh, all those points get at this extreme mapped to one point, all those points mapped to one point, that's high variance, but it's not a good representation. But in general, unless I'm really an evil adversary here, if I tell you there's two lines, one that has a large variance in AIs and one that has a small variance in AIs, it's reasonable to assume that the one with large variance captures more of the information of the data set within one dimensional constraint. Of course, if you use two dimensions, you get a better representation, but within restricted to one dimension, higher variance in principle means better representation. Are both those things the same, like minimizing square loss and maximizing the variance? I don't know. Are they? Max. Are those the same thing? Yeah. You just look at the line there, one that's on the points and one that's shifted to the right, you see that they have the same variance because of the square loss. Which one? So if you draw a point through the lines, or sorry, in the bottom right diagram, where you have the points all on a line, yeah. if you have one line that passed through all the points versus one that was shifted slightly along E2, they have the same variance with different square losses. Right. But uh, I think we should consider only the points that pass through mu. Only so I, 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 in that sense, all the lines I'm going to consider are the ones that pass into the center of the data. I'm going to ignore these other lines because I think it's very easy to prove for the square loss you can immediately update the square loss of everybody by moving to mu. That's a very simple thing we already did for regression. That any line that doesn't pass through mu, if you build the equivalent line that passes through mu, you obviously preserve the AI as far as the variance. You get the same variance, that's your point. But in terms of square loss, you definitely minimize the square loss if you move the line in the center of the data. 
that I think was an exercise in the first homework to say that every line moved to the center reduces the square loss. Because it is true that some projections might get actually bigger, but the vast majority will get smaller. I think we can. So back to his question, are those the same mathematical objects in terms of math? If they adequately correspond to the same thing or not? So I mean, uh, if you want to answer this question, I'm only taking clean proofs by Thursday. <laughs> so by doing those things, trying to maximize this variance or trying to minimize this loss, we need still some assumption. The land passed through mu, and are we still I mean, are we sure we're going to use geometric projections or not? Because that's not still decided. It's just written with geometric projections, but we're not sure. I don't know. 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 I don't know.